as an intellectual phenomenon. This is, I think, a very important subject. And, uh, Professor Yakira's work is very important on, a, on an issue which I would argue, and uh, others are arguing, is becoming sort of the new form of anti-Semitism, is the, the perception of Israel uh, in some circles. So this is a, an important topic and will be an important lecture. Um, and today, of course, as we speak, it's still Memorial Day in Israel. Israel is now in a moment of mourning uh, for the soldiers and people who defended Israel. And in a couple of hours, they'll celebrate their independence day. We have a, a moment of mourning to a time of celebration. Um, professor Yakira is the senior, was a senior lecturer and professor in the Department of Philosophy at the Hebrew University. He's been there since 1994. He's also a member of the International Scientific Committee of Studies and International, the International Supposed Spinoza Institute in Jerusalem. Uh, he, he was educated at Hebrew University where he, he received his BA and uh, master's degree in philosophy and history and then went on to do his doctorate degree at uh, the Sorbonne in Paris you know, uh, and did his degree in philosophy. He has written widely in English, French, and Hebrew. Uh, in 2006, he wrote a book that's uh, looking at post-Zionism and post-Shoah. Uh, and it was translated and published by Cambridge University Press in 2009. So it's really an honor that you're here, and, and welcome to you. So thank you very much.
phenomenon and how we need to judge uh, what uh, will come out of it and how dangerous it is. And, uh, exactly, but certainly this is a, a very important phenomenon. Um, today in Israel is the uh, Yom HaZikaron. We, we commemorate the, uh, the dates uh, during the, all the wars of Israel and commemorate the Day of Independence. A week ago, we commemorated uh, Yom HaShoah, the uh, day of uh, uh, the Holocaust. And, uh, and this is a very special week and very difficult week usually in Israel. I guess uh, it's where I have still, but maybe not that intensely. And um, uh, my book uh, precisely bears uh, about this connection between Yom HaShoah, or HaShoah, Holocaust, and Zionism in Israel, and uh, in, on, more specifically on the ways in which, contrary to what this connection in Israel uh, represents and what is the very often say, and written, of course, uh, on the ways in which the Holocaust has become actually a main argument, I would even say an arm, and an efficient one, in a white, all, all out uh, ideological uh, war, struggle uh, against Israel, against the and I shall, and, 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 and a very efficient arm. And uh, I shall not uh, get into the analysis I offer at the book in the way this is done. Whoever would like to see it can read it in the book. I shall, I want to concentrate on a few other things. Anyway, um, um, a week ago, uh, precisely at the day of the, uh, um, the Holocaust, uh, uh, parallel uh, institution to the one we are here now, uh, in Tel Aviv, the university, there is an institute for the study of anti-Semitism as well, headed by probably, some of you probably know her, Dina Povat, good friend. Uh, they publish, uh, they monitor, sort of monitor the uh, uh, anti-Semitic anti -Semitic, uh, incidents all over the world. And she, and, and I haven't yet had the time to read the report, but uh, uh, what uh, I was published and uh, she was interviewed uh, on the different uh, media uh, organs um, uh, in the last year, and especially since the, second, the war in Gaza, um, the number of uh, what is it uh, called um, anti-Semitic uh, incidents can be all the way from you know, insults and uh, to, to, to straightforward violence has uh, doubled all over the world. In France, in England, in other places, uh, this has uh, become um, a real issue. We're talking about hundreds, many hundreds of uh, incidents, more important, less important, uh, of anti-Semitic uh, nature uh, in the world. Uh, I don't know how it is in the United States, but in Europe certainly this is uh, beginning to be, uh, you know, um, worrying. Many times, though, when it comes to uh, more incidents of the more violent and more good, I would say, vulgar uh, nature, uh, it comes usually from two, if I'm talking about Europe, uh, it comes usually mainly from two, I think so, from two main quarters. It comes us, uh, either from uh, extreme right-wing hooligans, in one, one, way or one or four or another, or from Arabs, immigrants, North African, uh, of Africans uh, uh, of This has always been, I think, anti-Semitism uh, has always uh, provoked uh, violence of this kind. And I think basically this is not an interesting phenomenon. This is something to deal with, to 
to be to defend against when it becomes dangerous and sometimes it becomes dangerous. And this is the, the method for local police and local governments to deal with. I don't think intellectually talking it is a very interesting phenomenon. But there is another phenomenon which is much more interesting and in many, many, many ways much more significant. And this is the uh, another form of anti. Uh, let me, uh, actually, I don't. I won't. I don't want to call it anti-Semitism, and I, I'll try to explain. Uh, maybe I'll begin with uh, with an anecdote. I think it's very significant. Although it's very, as usual, it's very often in these cases, it's very difficult to pinpoint the exact significance of the thing. I'm talking about I, I, the, the invitation to come to the United States, this one, this my, my first visit here, uh, was initiated in at Minnesota. There's a guy in Minnesota, at, at the University of Minnesota, who is uh, been very active in anti-Israeli uh, anti activities, and he found himself completely uh, isolated, so almost completely lonely in this, uh, and he uh, read my book and he offered me to come. And I came. It was very nice, it was a very nice place, we had wonderful weather there, and um, he organized a public lecture, something like, that, like this one, uh, at the, one of the university institutes, which is called the Institute for Global Studies, and they have about 30 faculty. There were maybe 40 people in the lecture, it was very nice, but there was not a single faculty present. There were students, some people who came, some Israelis, Jews, I don't know who heard about this and came, but not a, a single faculty came to hear what an Israeli professor has to say about the problem of anti Zionism, Israel, and a few months ago, this was the immediate, I would say, uh, uh, raison d'etre of my being invited there, was a visit by someone by the name of Omar Baguti. Maybe you heard about it. Uh, if not, let me say a word or two. The guy is a, a PhD student at Tel Aviv University, an Israeli Arab, a uh, very bright guy, very articulate who, uh, who um, is uh, glo you know, globe-trotting uh, the, the, the whole planet, or at least in the West, uh, 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 trying to explain and to justify the call for BDS. He is a student, an art student at Tel Aviv University, going around all, all over the place, uh, calling for a boycotting his own university. And uh, he was invited, and there was, uh, a lot, the, of course, uh, a lot of faculty. Uh, I was invited afterward as a sort of uh, counter, I would say, counter discourse. And no one came. I think this is very significant. This is very significant <coughs> in the situation in which we Israelis <coughs> find ourselves here at the American <coughs> campus, in Amer many American campuses and in other places as well. Anti-Zionism is the name often given to this uh, kind of, uh, all kinds of, um, it's often quite different, uh, anti-Israeli attitudes. And this is what I would like to, to talk about a little bit here today. Um, Anti-Zionism is all is all the Zionism. It has been at the beginning <coughs> basically a Jewish phenomenon. In the Jewish world where Zionism was born, uh, from the beginning, it uh, was uh, opposed by, uh, by uh, Orthodox, by, um, by uh, 
communist, by uh, Buddhist, by uh, uh, assim assimilationist, uh, you name it. Uh, here in the United States, I think that much of the uh, more or less organized opposition to Israel as a state and to the Zionist idea as such comes, uh, I, uh, I, I, I say it with a lot of uh, precaution, and I'm not sure that I'm right, but I think that it is, comes much, uh, very often from, uh, from um, the reformist Jews. Uh, and in this sense, this is, uh, has been uh, always uh, an inner Jewish debate. Since the beginning, though, of the um, Jewish uh, Zionist uh, immigration into Palestine and into the land of Israel, um, uh, this opposition has become uh, also, of course, uh, non-Jewish. First of all, arms. The arms opposed the Jewish immigration, uh, the Zionist immigration from the very beginning, especially after the Balfour uh, Declaration, when it became clear that uh, we are talking about establishing a national home uh, for the Jewish people in Palestine. Uh, this has become active and very soon afterwards violent opposition to the Jewish immigration. But uh, this uh, opposition uh, was coming uh, also from other quarters as well. For instance, uh, I've been reading a book just to give you an example uh, about the Quai d'Orsay, about the attitude of the uh, French uh, foreign uh, service and diplomacy, uh, in the, uh, which is called the One uh, Century of, of, of Betrayal. And uh, it shows how uh, how constant uh, the opposition of, of French diplomacy to the idea of a national house, of a Jewish state, of Chinese, and in, in short, uh, is, uh, has always been there until more or less now. Uh, however, and then, of course, uh, 48, 47, 48, the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, the opposition to the state of Israel on many, many levels, in many, many ways, continued. And also anti-Zionism in many different forms. However, um, since I'm talking about mainly since 48, since the establishment of the state of Israel, I, can, I think that until lately, this opposition to Israel, to Zionism, anti-Zionism, I'm talking mainly about uh, Jewish uh, anti-Zionism, ideological uh, opposition to the Zionist idea, yeah. uh, and to some extent also non-Jewish. I would say that until lately, <coughs> anti-Zionism has been mostly passive anti-Zionism. <coughs> to put it very shortly, people would say, in Hebrew, we have a nice idiom, <coughs> we are not part of it. You do what you do. <coughs> you build uh, th uh, your country. Uh, we are not part of it. We, are, we, we live our lives, whether it is here in the United States or elsewhere. Don't bother us with this. We have kind of feelings. But we are not part of it. It's your, it's your business. Since a few years ago, several years ago, I think I can more or less <coughs> localize, okay, the, uh, the, the more or less precise point when this has changed, and maybe I'll say a word about it. It has become an active anti Zionism. Uh, what is new about this is that uh, 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 the possibility, the idea of dismantling. The Jewish state has become <coughs> something which is legitimate to say. In very different forms, some of them more modern, some of them less, more sophisticated, more subtle. For instance, it has become a mainstream almost in certain circles, academic and otherwise, to talk today. On one state, on the one-state solution, 
There are all kinds of, uh, of excuses and explanation, but if, but if you read, which things that I did, uh, the very few attempts to offer a serious outline for what is called the one state solution, you can see, and I'm not talking about the fact that it's not going to work anyway. Of course, everybody who has the slightest understanding of the situation in Israel, in the Middle East, uh, all knows about how it works in other places. It's by national solution. He knows that, not to speak about that, about 95, 98% probably of the Jewish population and the Arab population would never accept real by national solution. This is not the point. The point is that, once again, I'm coming back, I'm coming back to where I began this sentence. Uh, when you read the programs, the project, the, uh, the very few ones that were trying to allegedly attacks the question in a serious and a scientific way, you see that it is always based on uh, some kind or another of rejection of the right of the Jews to self-determination. Namely, to have their own state. People would say, yes, of course, the Holocaust, we learn from the Holocaust that the Jews need to have a haven, they have, need to be able to come, uh, you know, to run away from wherever they are perse per 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 uh, persecuted and, and come to, let's say, this land. But they will have to give up, which is only a kind of imaginary and, uh, you know, uh, not serious anyway, will to have their own uh, state or uh, state-like institutions. It's always like this. So, in other words, um, in other words, the idea of uh, of this active anti-Zionism. This is what I'm calling this active anti-Zionism. People would talk even, I'm not talking, they would talk seriously today about forcing the Jews, giving up the Jewish character of the state. And in one state, by national state, states of all, all its citizens, this is one of the slogans that is uh, in very uh, current, which are all, all hide the same thing. Uh, Jews do not have the right for self-determination. Or it is okay if we deny Jews the right of self-determination, one way or another. And, and the next thing, we have to take uh, concrete <coughs> steps in order to realize this non-national, post-national, anti-national, two-state, one-state, uh, whatever. You call it whatever you like. There are many, many, many names and titles. Uh, no. um, um, so, um, this is one thing that uh, is new about counter anti-Zionism. It is active and not passive. When did it happen? When did it uh, become a legitimate discourse? My impression that this has happened, this happened around 2000, late 2000. And to make a very long story short, I would say the following. In 2000, after the uh, failure of peace negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians uh, in Tel Aviv, led by uh, Barak and Barak on our side, uh, Yasser Arafat on the other side, um, uh, certain many people became trapped in a uh, in the Barak offered to the Palestinians. 
Palestinians in Camp David to go beyond the, uh, the peace programs, the most radical peace program offered by Israeli left, at least. Including, for instance, dividing Jerusalem. This has never been said explicitly by any of the Zionist left wing diplomats, uh, politicians in Israel. Yossi Sari, Yossi Bailey, you name it. Never thought that it would be possible. Barak accepted Iran in Jerusalem, and this is only as an indication of the lengths to which he went in order to get an agreement. Arafat refused. Arafat refused. I, want, I don't want to get into there are many, many, many uh, discussions around it. I don't want to get into it. I happen to write a book about this. I think I know what I'm talking about. Um, or involved actually in writing uh, some book. I think I know what I, 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 I know about uh, what I'm talking about in this respect. And uh, I think that President uh, Clinton has, has, has did say what has to be said. He said there was an offer on the table, the Israelis accepted, the Palestinians rejected, all the rest, all the rest is gossip. And, was it, and I think it was right. So at this very moment, if I had time, I would have told you a few very interesting anecdotes. Because when this happened, I was I happened to be in France on a sabbatical. And but uh, we don't have time to get into it. Anyway, the mi the minutes this happened, the minutes uh, violence erupted in Israel, in the Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians. Still, the, uh, the, what is called the Clinton power method, the Clinton proposition was still on the table. You could have heard already in Europe. And immediately, uh, in certain circles of Israeli left, this discourse, they not talking about the uh, one state solution. The dismantling of the Jewish state of Israel as a state. Immediately, still, I'm, to, I'm saying, still, Israel was offering to evacuate over 100 settlements, to divide Jerusalem, to go more or less back to the uh, 67, to establish a Palestinian state. It didn't work. The cause of the failure was the Palestinians. And immediately afterwards, this active anti-Zionism anti appeared in, uh, on the stage in Israel and elsewhere. Um, now, There is a terminological problem here, which is more, of course, as is very often the case, is uh, more than just terminological. Is, what is this anti-Zionism? Is it anti-Semitism? Why talk about anti-Zionism here in an institute? Uh, how is it? Uh, what, what's the name of that? Uh, <laughs> what? The Yale Initiative. Of anti Semitism. Why, why, why are you talking about anti Zionism, about anti Israelism, about Israel, Israel bashing in uh, here? So, um, because, and, and the answer is not simple. I want to say a few words about it. Um, <coughs> first of all, I would say anti Semitism, I'm sure you know. Uh, is a recent term. It was coined by the second half of the 19th century. And it's uh, in a very specific <coughs> historic uh, context. Opposition to Jews, uh, a few people were uh, 
proposing lately not to talk uh, on, on anti-Semitism, but about Judeophobia, hatred or opposition or rejection or whatever of Jews. And as you know, I think this is a very old phenomenon here. We find it already in the Greek world, some kind of uneasiness, almost, uh, I would say, aesthetic uneasiness in front of this uh, strange phenomenon that they found this corner, corner of the Middle East. I would say, in a very schematic way, that there are four stages in the history of antisemitism. This classical antisemitism, and then the Paulinian Christian antisemitism, which is the main, uh, the main mark, main element of trans uh, oil until uh, modern times. Then in modern times, the Jews became uh, emancipated, not anymore uh, recognized as different, in many European uh, states, uh, was born, was came, uh, uh, third uh, stage of uh, anti-Judaism, which is exactly anti-Semitism in its modern form, Russian, racist uh, form, uh, and then the modern one the actual, the contemporary one, the fourth stage, which is directed mainly against Israel. Now, in one sense, at least, there are more than this, but in one, one sense, at least, the contemporary anti-Judaism or hatred of uh, Israel or whatever is more similar to medieval anti-Semitism, to the religious and theological, which was religious and theological rejection of Judaism, is what I call Paulinian anti-Semitism or rejection of Judaism, then to the, um, to the uh, modern racist anti-Semitism. Why? I just want to take one element. There are more, but I want to take one element. Uh, in medieval anti-Semitism, the option of conversion existed, which has disappeared in racist anti-Semitism. People cannot convert from, right, from one race to another, or this is a deterministic form of existence, race, Islam, allegedly. But people can, and did, always, convert from one religion to another, accepting presumably uh, ideas, beliefs, ways of life. The way was open. It was more complicated than this, as we saw in Spain, after the forced uh, conversion of Jews in Spain. Uh, and here in Spain, the first uh, expression of uh, some kind of racist, blood-based uh, rejection of Judaism, but this is another story. Nowadays, the way of conversion is open again. And in fact, the anti-Israeli campaign is almost led by converts. Israelis, ex-Israelis, and Jews, who are today living in many cases, and if they are not, and they usually don't even understand to what they are being used and abused and and and. Uh, this campaign, anti-Israeli campaign, campaign all over the world. Um, <coughs> um, this is probably, to my mind, the ugliest, most problematic, morally 
aspect of contemporary anti Zionism. I know exactly how it works, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the little anecdote I just told you about uh, of people uh, coming to listen to Baguti and not listening to me is just one little example of how, this, how these things work. Um, well, I want to, to begin to finish so we can have some time to questions, but uh, I want to, um, to add one thing. I want to add one thing here. Um, maybe I will permit myself to say after all this, you know, uh, some, a few sentences about the book. The book has three essays, which are independent of one another, but have a certain common uh, theme, which is the uh, use of the, of the way of the Holocaust become different with the Holocaust and all the connection between the Holocaust and anti-Israeli attitudes, ideological, academic, theoretical, etc. The first part, I'm talking about a certain brand, I want to emphasize, a certain brand of Holocaust denial. This is the Holocaust deniers from the, uh, from the French left mainly. They take themselves to be intellectuals, and in a certain way, they belong to a certain intellectual subculture. They talk, they, question, they, they don't throw stones, they don't eat, they don't uh, burn uh, synagogues. They talk the question of theory. Some of them has gone all the way to straightforward Holocaust denial, to say in the most explicit and simple way, no, Nazis, Germans have never destroyed, killed Jews in the gas chambers. And they say, not despite being people from the left, but to the, as they see, because they think that people belong to the left. Second part, is deals with what I call in the book the good Israelis. Those people who like Barbuti, arms, non arms, Israelis, uh, traveling all over, invited all over. Uh, you just, uh, in all big, important campuses, you meet them, you see them, you hear them, they are all over the place. Uh, much more than people like me. Much easier for them to travel, to be invited, to be published, to be translated. Be read, and, uh, and 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 all of them, the ones I deal with, connect in one way or another. They are very radical criticism of Israel to uh, to the Holocaust in different ways. I don't want to get into it. Um, that I would add that since the last few years, this phenomenon is, uh, of the Israeli, the good Israel, uh, has acquired a very interesting uh, characteristic. These people have certain hold in um, universities in Israel, in Israel, in Israel, in Israel. They have a certain following students. But basically, they are very, they constitute a very, very small minority, even in universities. They stopped talking to us. They are now talking to their colleagues and comrades abroad, almost exclusively. This is very interesting to know. They are in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in Brazil, in Haifa, in Bailan. They get salaries from this institution and other benefits. I can show you that, relatively speaking, being a professor in a Israeli university 
is not such a bad deal. It's better, perhaps, being a professor in an American university. <laughs> but in Israel, it's also not that bad. So they are enjoying all this, and at the same time, doing what probably same. Maybe just a short anecdote here. One of the guys, of the people, used to be a friend of mine, like some others there, uh, called Abi Ophir, he's a professor at Tel Aviv University, and some other, a few other uh, institutions, has been uh, walk, uh, <coughs> traveling around like Baguti, uh, promoting a book he co-edited with an, uh, some two or three other people, uh, calling uh, the book basically all kind of theoretical discussion of some certification with the BDS. Um, one of the co-editors of the book is a guy from uh, an arm from um, uh, the American University in Beirut. And they were uh, going from a campus to campus in Europe and uh, the, when it, uh, people in Beirut found out about it, they published a, 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 a petition or some kind of something, uh, anyway, a paper called it saying that uh, it is uh, absolutely unacceptable for them, for the university in Beirut, American University in Beirut, that uh, if the, one of the faculty will, would collaborate with an Israeli. Mind you, the collaboration was about calling BDS against Israel, and Andy Ophir in particular, he has written explicitly about it, is calling uh, more and more uh, explicitly uh, to, uh, to, to dismantle Israel, to make it into a binational or whatever state. So even with these people, uh, the faculty of the American University in Beirut are not supposed to collaborate. That's a very interesting thing, I think. Um, anyway, the third part of the book, and I shall finish with saying a few words about this. It's about, Han, about Hannah Arendt. Now, Hannah Arendt was a great woman. No doubt about it. I think, though, that her attitude towards Israel <coughs> and towards Zionism, which is very long, it's something which goes all along uh, life, basically, or career, at least after, since she was a very, very young woman, constitute something that, which I would call a moral failure. A moral failure. She was, uh, she, she was apparently uh, 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 internally um, ambiguous always about her Zionism, about Zionism, about the state of Israel. But she, I would say she, uh, she didn't find another solution to this inner, inner strife within her about Israel, which had good, you know, sometimes positive, sometimes ne negative, other than writing this book some few pieces, and the book uh, on Ashman, which I think has done tremendous uh, uh, damage to the Zion Sadia, to the, to, the, to, the, to the image of Israel, and, uh, and, 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 and in other ways as well. Now, the point is, and this was one of the main reasons why I thought I should write something about her in this book, is that Hannah Arendt has become, as you probably know today, a hero uh, of intellectual culture in the West, and in, to some extent in Israel as well. She merits, to a large extent, this, uh, this, uh, this, I would say, this status. She was a very serious woman, very courageous in many ways, a fascinating figure, 
in many, many ways. But the hagiography, which is built around, was built around there, uh, I think should be seen as a huge appreciation, sometimes exaggerated, sometimes not, that uh, she enjoys nowadays should be seen in connection to this uh, role, her role in, 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 in presenting this uh, uh, image of Israel to the Jews and non-Jewish public outside of Israel. And this, I would say, and this would be my last remark here, that in a paradoxical sense, through the importance of Hannah Arendt in nowadays, in contemporary uh, intellectual culture. Through this, the, 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 her attitude toward Israel and Zionism, the ambiguity, um, we can, uh, and all the, this can, um, in some sense, e explain and expresses uh, something which is, again, parallel to, um, <coughs> to, uh, the to, to what we see in, in, in um, ancient times, in, um, at the beginning of Christian culture, and I mean this. Anti, uh, especially if you talk about Paulinian theology, and Paulinian Christianity, the attitudes towards Judaism is constitutive, was constitutive to the Christian self-perception and to Christian um, uh, civilization in general. And I would go as far as say that one of the things that we discover today that anti-Zionism playing a parallel and similar role, a constitutive role, in the formation of modern, nowadays, contemporary intellectual culture in the West. This is that important, and because of this importance, it is so harmful and dangerous and morally outrageous. Thank you very much. I'll finish here, so we have some time for questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your important work. And um, I feel like I can ask you 40 questions. So I, I'll just make some brief comments. I think you, you touched on many important things. One thing that you touched on was the role of, um, of Reformed Judaism. Uh, in the United States. And I find it fascinating, uh, especially in the President Obama's Seder in the White House. In Reform Judaism, it, it, it uh, disconnects from traditional Judaism in the sense that Israel and Jerusalem is no longer the center, but the center is uh, that New Jerusalem would either be Berlin or, or Washington. The Berlin experience for Reform Jews obviously failed, but there's apparently this hope that it will uh, succeed here. Um, and it's also, I would say, that's one phenomenon in the, the American Jewish community that I find fascinating. Another... But you agree with my... This, uh, I agree, yeah, I, think, I think you touched on something. There's something happening in the American Jewish community that I think is important to look at. And I think the, the role of Reform Judaism in, in uh, <laughs> its perception and relationship to Israel and its uh, perception of its future in the United States is in the American society. I find it fascinating, worthy of uh, serious research. Okay. Um, and there's also uh, a, a disconnect between some of the American Jewish community and Israel, and there's uh, there's a tension. Um, and uh, some of it, some of the criticism perhaps is warranted, but I think there's some that are not. So for people, for example, who are dealing with anti-Semitism and contemporary context, people like me and other scholars who go around dealing with these issues were often perceived as the enemy, even within the Jewish community, among Jewish intellectuals and, and other liberal intellectuals that were somehow Bush supporters and neocons and war mongers. Or, you know, this, that was happened to me. Yeah, so we, 
we, we, and as you say, and I think this is very important, we don't have, uh, we're not kosher, we haven't converted, uh, in a sense. And I, I, so I think this notion of conversion is very powerful, too, that you speak to. And I find this externally dangerous. It reminds me, and uh, I think in the American Jewish leadership in the 1930s, there was a silence, um, that there was a feeling among some leaders that either speaking shtetl, primitive shtetl Jews coming to the United States would uh, create anti-Semitism, and there wasn't an outcry, even among the Jewish leaders, to bring in refugees when there could have been more done. They knew, <coughs> Roosevelt knew in 1942 that the Holocaust was underway, etc. Um, and the irrationality of it, because of, and then you speak about Holocaust and the irrationality, that here we have Ahmadinejad and the Iranian regime, not the people, but the regime, that is genocidal and it's anti-Semitism. They're open, they're honest, they're consistent, they have an ideology, they have symbols, they have policies, they have religious rulings. They're clear what they want to do. And, there's a, and I would see this as a social movement uh, changing the, the face of the, at least the Middle East. And yet you have liberal intellectuals, as you say, particularly in Europe, that speak of a one-state solution, of human rights, of, uh, of some <coughs> of, uh, you know, twisted notion of uh, social justice and national identity and that Jews are not entitled to self-determination. And yet, we would be throwing, if this would happen, we'd be throwing a, a democratic society with contradictions and problems to, to the wolves. And here is a, a social movement that the, the, the left-wing intellectuals would expect Israelis to share society with, with one of the most reactionary social movements on the planet. This is a social movement that wants to destroy democracy. It wants to kill Jews, or, or at least remove Jews from having self-determination, create different levels of citizenship for different groups of people, like women and gay people and other religious minorities, um, have different legal systems, and yet human rights activists and some liberal intellectuals in the West would, uh, would allow Jews to be, to have that, to share that faith with this social movement. So the contradictions are glaring. And um, I would even say that the, the Obama's policy and, and containment of uh, Iran smacks of this, uh, of this problem. How, 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 how do you perceive, how do we unpack it as intellectuals, as people concerned about human rights, and also not just the fate of the Jewish people, but of, of social democracy and, and humane values. How do we get our message across? And, and, and just to add to, you, to the question, I think one of the difficulties that I have, and I think other scholars have, is that we speak to well-intentioned, highly educated, well-read, good people in our fields. When we talk about this issue, it's like, their eyes glaze over and they're disconnected. I know. I know how, do we, how do we deal with this? How do we get this message out of this tremendous and dangerous contribution? Can we take small person or can we? It's up to you. Let me throw a smoke bomb into the room. Okay, I am a retired uh, US diplomat. I am now an independent scholar. I consider myself conservative. I have always been, although I was never, until very recently, even a member of the Republican Party. If you look at the polling data in the United States, take the most recent one, views on Israel, 63% support. That's general in the public. More, I think. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the lowest one. So The last one, I think, it was more than 70 yeah, if you take if you take how many what is two percent of the population is Jewish, there is a vast pool of Americans who have an understanding of Israel, an intuitive affinity, and I will tell you that most of them are not liberal. They may be independent, they may be conservative, they are not represented in most of academia. That is a fact. I think one of the problems. In, I don't speak to Europe because I think that's a different problem. Oh, but right. the problem here is that this political segregation occurred. So the people talk to each other and they get in a hothouse 
environment. But it is not, it is too, so far, the elite in the United States has not succeeded in convincing the rest of the population. And I will say, I think now with the Tea Party movement and things like that, it's going to be more difficult for the elite to persuade the average American of many points of view, of which anti-Zionism is just one. So that's kind of a positive. The problem is <laughs> there's a big gulf. The people that you would speak to at universities, absolutely, there is no connection. And the people who have this general sense are completely disconnected. That's a, that's, a, that's a difficult, and I say that because I don't think that's the same in Europe. I think the European issue has a lot more baggage with it. You know, <laughs> there were many people who, who uh, experienced the Holocaust and didn't find it negative. So that, uh, that's, a, that's a baggage that you can push it down as far as it's you want. It's not back. necessarily better. Hmm? It's different. It's in, different. It's not necessarily better. No, no, no. I'm not saying it's better, but I'm saying it's, it's deep, very different. They're it's very different, different atmospheres. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two things. One, on uh, uh, May 1st, first. <laughs> uh, May, uh, May 1st, there's going to be May Day, which is a leftist uh, celebration on the New Haven Green, it's Shabbat. For s some people wouldn't uh, have anything to do, go there or, or drive there or anything. But last year there was an Israeli boycott um, table. And if anyone wants to go and see it and talk with those people, uh, it's going to be on the Green May 1st. And secondly, I was wondering how the uh, non-acceptance of reform converts and conservative converts to uh, um, in, by the Israeli uh, Orthodox rabbis has anything to do with attitudes towards Israel, um, you know, because uh, there's been a lot of uh, writings in conservative magazines and reform magazines about conversion problems. Okay. Let's take another question. Okay. I want to address two, two topics that you mentioned in your talk. One is uh, the Holocaust as a, as a major issue. Uh, for the intellectuals, uh, not um, the only intellectuals. Ahmed Najad is, is, is also one of them, and I don't consider him to be an intellectual. Uh, uh, that they use that as a, a major vehicle to deny the right of Israel to exist. And the other issue is the one state uh, solution. Uh, I think that th those two issues became uh, a really a direct result of a policy that had been pursued by the official policy that was pursued by the state of Israel for all, so many years, that they really hinged the existence of Israel, the justification for the existence, on the Holocaust. On the other hand, for all these years, it, they put it in the shadow the situation of the Jews who lived in our countries, that the, uh, the precarious situation that they had lived there, and the very fact that almost none of them left there. All of them left those Arab countries. They are not there anymore. So why? Not, and those, that thing is important because it can, be, it can serve as a strong indicator to what Jews can expect to live as a minority in a one-state situation. Nobody was talking about it till today. And this is, I think, is uh, the fault of uh, the uh, omission of, by the Israeli establishment. Why they, did they follow this line? It's beyond me. But this is, uh, this, I consider that, what is your opinion about it? Okay, I'll try to uh, comment uh, on, the co on the comments. Uh, <laughs> um, let me say this. Uh, let me begin from the end. Um, I don't, I did it then to do it in my book and not in the very numerous uh, discussions that I participated in at all forms after the appearance of the book, neither here or in the United States, not even today. I don't want to make the apology of Israel. Uh, 
uh, when we see it, uh, I don't know how many of you know the, the institution of uh, Friday nights uh, in the Israeli houses and uh, when we see it, the friends and we do nothing about uh, <coughs> about the government, about the state, about everything that happens. There is a, a very famous, uh, I think this is maybe the best uh, definition of anti-Semitism, which is uh, that uh, an anti-Semit is someone who hates the Jews more than they deserve. Uh, I can say that uh, the same thing can be said about Israel. There's a lot of things that can be said about Israel, a lot of criticism, in many ways. Uh, however, I think that the idea that, and I'm talking about right now in my book, the idea that Israel has somehow used the Holocaust in order to justify itself in many ways is false. It is simply not the case. Uh, it has become one of the anti-Israeli myth that used the Holocaust as an argument. Um, one of the arguments that uh, this, this left wing and other uh, Holocaust deniers use is precisely this. Israel, beside the fact that the, uh, uh, I'm telling you the book, uh, uh, an amazing incident that I had, I spent a uh, few hours with one of the main uh, Holocaust denier of this book. It's called it Pierre Guillaume. Speaking of you, maybe I would be able to say Holocaust denier. I heard the name. Uh, I, he didn't know at the beginning from where I was from, where I came from. And for hours and hours on, he explained to me, uh, I was asking questions, and he was giving answers. Very nice person, by the way. Uh, is explaining to me that uh, Auschwitz never took place, uh, gas chambers never, never existed, etc., etc. And then I asked him, look, what kind of uh, 